Well, we're wrapping up tonight our discussion on prayer as a part of our discipleship uh, in daily life class. And we've been following the acronym of ACTS with adoration, confession, and thanksgiving being areas of prayer that we've covered. And tonight we end on supplication, which Randy introduced to a Sunday. Uh, interestingly enough, I think we've talked about supplication in each and every one of the uh, previous classes. It has its way of winding up in our prayers. And in some ways, that's entirely appropriate because we are in the position as creatures who are in need uh, of crying out to God to provide what only he can and what we uh, are dependent upon him for, which is a posture of humility and I think is wholly appropriate for us as believers to do. Uh, we've tried to, however, uh, emphasize the importance of not allowing our prayer lives to collapse entirely into this category, which it can easily do, where all we think of God is of think of God as being is sort of the ultimate genie in the, the bottle or the vending machine in the sky who can you know, give us what, what we want. Uh, I, I remember hearing someone uh, make fun of that approach by saying, you know, it's, their prayer life is like, hey, God, this is Jimmy, let me tell you what I need you to give me. Uh, and and we, we, we can all imagine uh, going to that ex extreme, maybe we've known people who, who are and uh, that's certainly a problem to be avoided. However, uh, we are invited repeatedly throughout Scripture to come before God, to make our requests known to God, uh, to do so expectantly in faith, uh, expecting uh, Him to, to provide an answer. Yet, it seems like as we've talked about prayer requests or supplications uh, and intercessions that uh, have come up, throughout the, the previous three topics, it seems that, that often we discuss the struggles that we encounter as we do so, that we ask for things and it seems like the answers aren't forthcoming or not in the timetable that we would desire, or sometimes it feels like, uh, as C.S. Lewis describes uh, in one place, it feels like the, the doors of, of heaven are just shut in our face. And that is a problem for us. But uh, one of the best things that we could do in, in I think, dealing with that uh, human experience is to realize how frequently it is experienced by great men and women in Scripture. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon that we have stumbled upon. In fact, the great prayer book of the Bible, the 150 Psalms, the majority of those psalms are psalms of lament. Uh, I think one of the corrections that perhaps we need is that we need to, to learn to pray our lamentations. We need to learn to sing our lamentations uh, as, as we see outlined for us in, in the psalms. For example, Psalm 13 says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise. For he has been good to me. So a uh, wonderful model uh, here for us, but it opens with this great lament, doesn't it? And this question primarily in that opening section was what? How long? How long? Uh, so this implies that he's been asking for a while. And to this point, the answer to whatever specific request he's been making has, has not come, at least not in an affirmative <coughs> response. And he sees himself uh, sinking. He sees himself in a rather desperate situation. Um, and uh, he brings his case, he presents his case before the Lord. And, and, and it's interesting to notice how he does it. He, he says, essentially, Lord, if you don't do something, and 
it seems to me pretty soon, this isn't going to turn out well for either one of us because I'm no longer going to be in the land of the living and you're no longer going to receive the praise that uh, you seek from me. So he asks for God to look upon him, but he ends the psalm. And most of the psalms of lament, there are a few exceptions, but most of the psalms of lament resolve themselves with a return to praise. And here I think it's instructive that he ends the psalm in praise even though there's no evidence within the psalm that the request has yet been answered. Um, so uh, an important place, uh, I think, for us to begin is the recognition that we're not alone in uh, dealing with the problem of prayers that uh, take a while to answer or perhaps the, re the answer is, is no in certain circumstances. But this is not in any way intended by, by me tonight to be a discouragement to you or myself of bringing our request to God and praying to him for what we need. I love Luke 18 and the story that Jesus tells there, and he tells it for a specific purpose. He says he, he taught this parable to his disciples so that they would uh, learn or for the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And does anybody remember the story that he tells? Yeah, the, the persistent widow who, who goes before this uh, earthly judge and asks him to uh, take up her case uh, against someone who has wronged her or is oppressing her. And what's this judge's uh, attitude toward her requests? Does he respond immediately? No. He, he doesn't pay any attention. But what happens? She wears him down. She wears him down. <laughs> she just keeps coming back. And so finally, what does this judge do? Okay, I'll hear your case because you're just wearing me out. And Jesus' lesson that he wants us to draw from that is not that God is an unjust judge who we will just need to wear him down till finally he's so tired of hearing us you know, knocking at the door that he just finally says, sure, I'll, I'll give you what you want if you'll just go away. But uh, rather, he would tell us that if persistence would prevail upon an unjust judge to do that, then how much more should we be inclined to pray to a God who is inclined toward us, who cares for us, who loves us, and who is just. So we are encouraged and invited by no less authority than the Lord Jesus himself to bring our request before God that we ought always to pray and we ought not to lose heart. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep, uh, keep on asking. Now, what I want to do for a little bit then is talk tonight. I, I just thought about this all day and just, uh, you know, things kept accumulating. So I came up, I don't know how you come up with a number like this, but 11 reasons <laughs> why our prayers go unanswered. Because this just has seemed to me to be a, a thought that is on our minds throughout uh, the course of uh, the last few weeks. So um, these are kind of all over the place. This is not a, a real careful, logical progression. But one uh, strikes me, and this is probably the most complex of the uh, things that I want to share. So track with me closely. Uh, God's fatherly love, and I've italicized the word fatherly here because there's a difference. I mean, this can be overstated. The differences between men and women generally are, are sometimes overstated. Uh, maybe right now in our culture, they're maybe understated. But there's a difference between the way fathers love their children and the way mothers love their children. Uh, mothers uh, tend to be the ones who provide the, 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 the nurture and the comfort uh, and fathers uh, sometimes are more stern, uh, but often uh, they, I, I remember just as an example one time, uh, me getting in a, you know, I got in a lot of fights when I was a kid for whatever reason. I was, in, I was in the front yard fighting this kid that was like four or five years older than me. And uh, all of a sudden, for whatever reason, we stopped fighting because we, we looked toward the front door and my dad was just, just standing there in the doorway just watching the fight. <laughs> he didn't run. You know, if it had been my mother, she would have just seen it. She would have just come barreling out there and 
thrown herself between me and what she would have certainly seen as this horrible older assailant, you know, uh, beating uh, up her, her son. So, uh, but, but dad just, he just, he just, I'm sure if it had gotten out of hand, he would have, he would have stepped in. But um, there, there's a difference uh, in, in an approach. And God is uh, primarily presented uh, to us in the uh, image of a uh, father and his love for us as a father. And so he makes space for us to mature through struggles and leaves us sometimes alone to make hard decisions without always rushing in there to solve the problem uh, for us. Uh, he tests us to reveal things about us to ourselves, to others, maybe even in some sense uh, to himself, uh, and uses these trials to forge our character. He, um, all this is connected, at least in my mind. He forbids in the law divination and necromancy, for example, where you know, we, we always want to know what's the future, what's going to happen, what's the right decision to, to, to make. And we want God to answer all of these things for us. But in, in many ways, he forbids the methods, at least that the pagans use, to try to discern the divine will for those kinds of things because he wants Israel, he wants his people to grow in wisdom and maturity to be able to uh, be his image bearers in the world and reflect his judgments, his righteous judgments in the world. And so we sometimes are left to make difficult decisions and deal with difficult situations um, for that purpose. I think about examples uh, right off the bat. He puts Adam and Eve in the garden and in some sense disappears until after the temptation has taken place. He, he undoubtedly sees what is taking place. He doesn't jump into the middle of the situation. He allows it to take its course and then appears uh, after the temptation. In John chapter 9, uh, this came to mind in uh, the healing of the blind man, one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite minor characters in the Bible is the blind man there in John chapter 9 because you, you remember the after Jesus heals him he sends him to the pool to wash and he comes back seeing and then there's this big to do because this this guy who was born blind is now seeing and everybody's talking about it and somebody decides well we've got to we got to bring this to the Pharisees attention the Pharisees come in and they begin to question the parents and the parents say hey we you know we got nothing to say about this He's of age, ask him. So they begin to have this exchange with him and he's brilliant in his exchange with the Pharisees, right? Uh, and, and they keep you know, making these arguments and he just keeps making these simple replies that exposes their hypocrisy until uh, finally, do you remember what happens to him? So they put him out. Yes. They dismissed him, kicked him out of, of the synagogue, which was a very significant uh, thing in the Jewish community and to no longer be able to participate in that was uh, serious and it was the reason why his parents were unwilling to weigh in on the argument but uh, Jesus is nowhere there in all of all of this and then after the fact after he's been kicked out the chapter ends with Jesus seeking him out engaging him in conversation and it ends with him uh, worshiping the Lord um, but there's, there's something about him leaving him alone to go and deal with the Pharisees. And it, it reveals something powerful about his faith um, that he was able to do so. And I just think there's something instructive to us about that. And then uh, the last one's not in the Bible, uh, but from the series The Chosen, which I know a lot of you watch. One of the most intriguing features of that series to me is that Jesus is absent, what, 75% of the time, those of you who are chosen watchers, <clears throat> usually for half to three quarters of each episode, no Jesus. It's, it's the disciples, and, and what are they usually doing? Looking for, him. <laughs> Looking for him, talking about where is he, why isn't he here, if you watch season three, especially toward the end, Peter and his wife were going through, you know, a real crisis of faith because of a miscarriage that she had had. And 
it put a strain on their relationship. And again, this idea of, well, why is Jesus healing all of these strangers? But, you know, we're nearest and dearest to him, and we can't even seem to pay, get his attention to even notice what we're struggling with. And um, so that, that kind of thing is, is going on all the time in these episodes. And they're, they're, the disciples are usually arguing with each other, but they're also having to make a lot of decisions. And it's sort of like they didn't have the bracelets, but they're like, well, what would Jesus do? He kind of comes back in all the time. How, how are we going to handle this? But it, it calls for them to, to think, doesn't it? To, to work through this and try to grow and mature in their decision-making uh, abilities. And so maybe, that's a long-winded answer. Uh, obviously, I can't do that on all 11 of them. But uh, God's fatherly love could be a part of why sometimes our prayers aren't answered immediately or in the way that we think that they should be. Um, then a uh, second one is because of free will. Free will, the world that God has chosen to create, the one he has actually actualized that we're participating in, is, is one in which human, uh, humans are moral, free moral agents, right? We, we make choices. And it seems that uh, that's the kind of world uh, that allows the virtue of love, which God has ordained as the supreme virtue, uh, to be operative. In other words, God doesn't force himself upon us. He uh, woos us uh, to choose him, to love him, to obey him, but he, he rarely imposes his will upon another person. And, and often we find ourselves, I think, offering prayers that if you think about how would God actually answer this prayer, in many cases it would, it would require him to impose his will upon another person, to just simply force them to do or change uh, in a sort of mechanistic uh, kind, of, kind of way. Uh, so rather than that, I think that um, we should see that God is often wanting us to use influence, either our own or other people, to bring about changes in those that we're praying and interceding for. So some prayers remain yet unfulfilled because they're working gradually by means of influence rather than suddenly as an impersonal mechanism of force control. Does that make sense? Um, so that's the third. The fourth is because he has something better in mind. The great theologian, uh, Garth Brooks uh, <laughs> said, I thank God for unanswered prayers. Um, was it that Garth Brooks? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, he may have something better in mind, and I can't think of a better example of that than one of my favorite. I said John 9 was one of my favorites, but one of my <laughs> most, you know, uh, uh, really favorites. Uh, <laughs> is John 11 with Mary and Martha and the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And they prayed to Jesus in a sense. I mean, writing a letter or sending a message to Jesus who was a few days journey away is a prayer, right? It's a request. And they send this request to Jesus. And what, do they, what is their request? What do they say? It's, the request is implied. They give him a statement, but the request is implied. What do they say? Yeah, they're, they're, the Come statement here. is... Come here. Yeah, but what is the actual statement, though? Lord, the one you love is sick. Implication is, you're gonna, surely you're going to come do something. And we wouldn't have told you this if it wasn't of great concern to us. So what does Jesus do? Waits Please. four days. <laughs> Waits four days. Um, it says, in fact, that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so he waited. Okay. And then when he finally gets there, what has happened? 
Stephen. Lazarus is dead. He's died while Jesus was waiting. And Mary and Martha both come out to him and basically say the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. And you, you, you can get the sense of the rawness of their emotion. <coughs> I think it's, it's you know, they're, they're, not, they're not rejecting Jesus. They're not accusing him. But there, there, there is in that a statement of, why didn't you come? We kept telling everybody, it's okay. Jesus will be here. He's going he's gonna to fix this. Uh, if you had been here, Lord, this, this wouldn't, have, wouldn't have happened. And do you remember what Jesus says to them? Doesn't he first say he'll rise again? Yeah, yes. He'll rise, he'll rise again. And, and I think it's Mary who says, yes, I, I know. Uh, it sounds like kind of funeral home talk. You know, people say these encouraging platitudes to one another and, and Mary's like yes yes I know in the resurrection and the, the you know, orthodox Jewish uh, res response to this and then Jesus suddenly kind of breaks through that um, civil and cordial funeral parlor conversation with the words Mary I am the resurrection and the life and um, ultimately, he comes to the tomb, and against the people's better judgment, the stone is rolled away, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man uh, came out of the tomb. So Jesus is revealed to Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and to everyone else who was there as one who not only was the healer of sick, the sick, but the resurrection and the life. The one who has uh, the power over death, our great enemy itself. And it says as a consequence of that, that many believed in him. So uh, Jesus had something better in mind. And though they were disappointed, they came to understand that delay is not necessarily denial. And that uh, we know that he can. And sometimes he waits and that we can trust him while we wait. The fifth reason is uh, unasked or improperly motivated requests. Uh, Randy talked about this on Sunday from James chapter 4. Sometimes we don't get what we want because we don't ask. Sometimes we ask and don't get because we ask it simply for the most selfish and base reasons. Lord, I, I just really need you know, that fancy item you know, whatever it is. Um, and he has some rather harsh things to say about that. Uh, number six, sometimes we're not ready for it. We may be asking for a blessing that we are not prepared to steward properly at this, at this point, and that it would not actually be as good for us as we think. The timing maybe is just not right. Number seven, uh, because of spiritual warfare. We don't talk about this kind of thing as much maybe as we ought in our circles, but I'm thinking of Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel, a righteous and godly man, prays, has, has a, a, a vision of a, of a sort, and is, uh, as we said back home, bum-fuzzled by what he sees, <laughs> and immediately sends up a request, I guess, for a deeper understanding of the significance of the vision that he has seen, and uh, then begins to continue to pray and fast for three weeks. Um, I didn't put, I could have done 12. Maybe our prayer is an answer because we didn't fast. Because there's some things that only come with prayer and fast. But he prays and fasts for three weeks. Have y'all ever prayed and fasted for three weeks? I don't either. So he does that. And then at the end of three weeks, on the 24th day of the month, suddenly an answer comes. Uh, uh, an angel, uh, uh, a divine being, uh, a being from uh, the divine realm comes to him to answer his question. And he tells him something that's rather stunning. He says, I heard you the first time. <laughs> and I was on my way from the very beginning because you're beloved of the Lord. 
And my delay has nothing to do with uh, you know, slowness on God's part. But on the way, I, I was, I was uh, distracted and deterred because the prince of Persia, Persia thank you, uh, he was putting up quite a struggle, and I had to deal with that. And in fact, I had to stay there until Michael, the archangel, comes and uh, gave me leave to come finally to answer your question. Now, that's pretty crazy stuff, right? But it tells us that there are many more things in creation than what our eyes can see. Now, we, we know that even scientifically, right? Like the vast majority of objects in this room are utterly invisible to mm -hmm. us, right? We, I guess we know that. Um, and, and yet our, our vision is made to uh, help us to, to survive and function uh, in this world and we basically are enabled to see what we need to see and eliminate all of the noise that would otherwise be in the way if we could see it all. But th that ought to, in some analogy, help us understand that there's also beings and realms and, and goings-ons in the universe that are beyond our <laughs> comprehension, beyond our knowledge, beyond our, uh, at levels of consciousness, maybe a, a best way to put it, that are uh, beyond our own. And uh, we should recognize that there are things like that at play that in this instance was a specific reason why Daniel's prayer request went unanswered for three weeks. All right, number eight, uh, relationship. We've talked about this quite a bit, but God is using our sense of need to draw us into a deeper relationship with him. I think that's often why, one of the main reasons why prayers perhaps go unanswered for a season is because in our need, we cry out to God. We seek him in ways that when things are simply going our way, we don't, we don't seek after the Lord. And he is ultimately about relationship. He's better than anything he can give us. And then um, we've uh, talked about this, but only from a negative standpoint, lack of faith. Is it fair to say that? In other words, can this be abused? Can, can, this, uh, can someone say the reason you're not getting what you're praying for is because of your lack of faith? Is that something that could be ab abusive? Sure, we've talked about could it also be true? Yes. Yeah, it could be. Uh, and there are instances that we find of Jesus uh, teaching that that is a problem. So we need to use a lot of caution here. Um, but also we need to remember that we are told that, that sometimes it is a lack of faith that can keep us from receiving what we ask for because we're asking in a rather half-hearted way manner or not believing that God really cares about us. And then 10, uh, because of sin. Let's just very quickly look at Psalm 66, 18. I've got it open here. It says, the psalmist here is uh, going along and talking about the awesome deeds of God and his answer to his prayers. And he says in verse 18, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So he indicates here that um, righteousness in our lives is at least many times a condition for prayers uh, being answered. So if we're living a basically uh, willfully disobedient life, you know, we're, we're, we're not making a genuine effort to serve the Lord. We, we ought not to expect that all of our requests are going to be received by him in a, a favorable light. And then uh, along a similar line, but in a specific way, let's look at Isaiah 58, the verses 6 through 9. Uh, yes. Something along with sin uh, there's a verse, and I can't think of it, but it comes with marriage. Uh, like, if a man is not treating his wife appropriately, the Lord actually turns from his prayers. Like, he will not, he will not hear his prayers. Um, so that, I think that's a specific example of 
sin, and God literally doesn't listen. Exactly. He, he talks there, uh, Pete, First Peter, he's talking to husbands and wives, and to husbands specifically, he says that if you're mistreating her, uh, that's one of God's daughters that you're mistreating. Don't expect God then to look favorably upon, upon you. Uh, so that's a, that's a really good uh, scripture. And then this one, Isaiah chapter uh, 58, verses 6 through 9. He says, is this not the fast that I choose? So here's the kind of fast that God that really pleases God. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless, in, the homeless poor into your house? when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, that's prayer. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. Um, so specifically here, he speaks to Israel about the reason uh, in part for not answering their prayers. They're given over to injustice. And if they would change their ways, they could see God respond to them in a very different way. So those are some reasons. I'm sure many others could be added besides uh, perhaps why our prayers sometimes go unanswered. And there are, are, are many reasons for that. Uh, but none of this, again, is to discourage us from prayer. So what I'd like to do in the 10 minutes that we've got remaining is ask you, what are some inspiring examples of prayer, of, of prayers and of the prayers, prayers that they <laughs> offered? Uh, in the Bible that have encouraged you. People who've made requests to the Lord. And, yes. well, this one uh, isn't answering what you just said about people okay. making requests. Um, but they have been two inspiring examples for me recently that I've been spending a lot of time with, which is when uh, the Lord's Prayer recently has had a uh, new meaning for me and uh, <clears throat> regularly going to that and, and saying that it's like basically my intro for me um, yes. really has helped me set my mind in the right place and really has aligned a lot of things. Um, so that's been a neat thing. And then the other, the other one is in Mark 11 where it talks about, uh, you know, when he curses the fig tree and it withers, he talks about if you had just had faith, is, you know, and told that mountain to get torn and thrown into the sea, which is, that statement's always been hard for me, like grappling, like, what are you talking about? But right after that, he says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. But then he follows that and says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. And so those two things for me were really big ones to focus on in my life, which was, am I really believing? And then also, am I holding things against people? And then regularly practicing the help my unbelief and forgiving people and through that practice of like, who in my life do I need to forgive? Besides the blanket statement, you know, every, anybody, but just really. And then, even if it's like, I don't know how to forgive that person, just obey in that. Very good, yeah. And it's, it's, there is such emphasis both there and then in Matthew 5 about the importance of forgiveness and how uh, our failure to forgive one another has a remarkable way of blocking our relationship with God and the exchange of blessing that could be ours that we're forfeiting. So one of my favorites is Acts 4, where the prayer actually caused plate tectonics. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Peter and ja uh, James, James and John, Peter, Peter and John. Peter and John. Peter and John were arrested, uh, imprisoned, beaten, threatened, let go, and they immediately got their friends together, the church or the believers together, and they 
I think that's a really good one because they do make prayer requests there. Uh, they, they ask God to look at the situation and see what is going on. That, quoting Psalm 2, the Gentiles and Jews have conspired together against your servant Jesus and us, his people, to stop the move of God that, that you have initiated here. So look upon this, Lord. Don't let them prevail. Uh, and they don't say, make the persecution stop. They do say, give us courage to continue boldly proclaiming your word regardless of what they do. And the place was shaken um, by this boldness of, of, of prayer. So, uh, yeah, I, again, that, that's, that's just a very inspiring example and instructive on numerous levels. Somebody else? Yes. I'm trying to find uh, the specific chapter, but when Abraham sends his servant to get a wife for Isaac, he says, go back to my homeland, so he doesn't marry a foreign woman. And when the servant gets there, he prays, you know, send this woman, here's, you know, here's how you should show her to me. And it says, before he was even done, Rachel was approaching. And so we've, we've talked about God's delay, and I've thought a lot in my life about you know, God's timing is different than ours, and how that works and all that, but at the same time, yes. his timing is also perfect. <laughs> and it can be, he was answering the prayer before the prayer was done. Yeah. Amazing. And it shows that we can pray for, you know, our son to our daughter to find a, a husband or a wife, right? Uh, this is a request that pleased the Lord. Um, and that they found the right one. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I thought about Hannah in the Old Testament and her prayer. And again, it wasn't a self-serving prayer. She, she pretty much gave up everything uh, that is instinctual for a young mother uh, by having him and then devoting him to the Lord. Um, she, uh, and Elijah is a great example. <laughs> Paul and his prayers uh, and then, of course, the Psalms. And then, uh, as uh, Stuart mentioned a moment ago, the, the Lord's Prayer. I, I believe this is a prayer uh, we should memorize. It's something I think we should repeat frequently. It, like Stuart said, forms the primary basis for most of my personal private prayers. It is very often a beginning, <laughs> beginning point uh, for me. And... Uh, According uh, to some scholars, Matthew's entire gospel is arranged in triads, in groupings of three, including the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, introduced, according to this formulation, with three by threes in the introduction and the Beatitudes, three images of the disciples as salt, light, and the city. And then the main body has three parts. Uh, fulfilling the Torah in two examples of three case studies of that. Three ways of doing your righteousness before God and not before people. Alms, prayers, and fasting. Three teachings on uh, uh, that follow that. One on money, one on difficult relationships, and one on the golden rule. And then it concludes with three warnings. The wide and the narrow gate, the two kinds of trees, good fruit, that bear good fruit and bad fruit, and two kinds of foundations, the sand and the rock. So when you look at it that way, uh, you, and you put it all together, you see that the central part of this is uh, the three ways of doing your righteousness before God and not people being alms, prayers, and fasting. So in other words, this teaching on what it means to be, our, to, to be in the kingdom of God, this, this primary teaching of Jesus about the nature of the kingdom, has at the center of the center of the center, prayer. That is, it seems to me, the central point, the ground zero of the kingdom of heaven. And... Uh, in it, he teaches us uh, how 
his disciples should pray. And one way to do this that I learned from John Stott was reading the, the introductory section where he tells you not to pray like the Gentiles, not to pray like the Pharisees and the hypocrites. But then he tells us, here's how you should pray. And then he gives what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. But as you get to that point, just sit quietly and, as it were, hear God asking you, who am I to you? And answer that, well, you're my Father in heaven. And then hear him respond to that by asking, that being so, what is your greatest desire? Well, that would be to see your name reverenced and your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then hear him ask, well, what could I do for you that would help you participate with me in making that happen? And your, your response is, give me today my daily bread. Forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who've trespassed against me. And lead me not into temptation, uh, but deliver me from evil. And uh, this is, I think, a good way to begin a, a good prayer session and to see it in terms of relational and to see it in terms of priority of, of, of praise and honor the Father in heaven. <coughs> Getting your priorities set that the most important things to you are seeing his will done, his kingdom advanced, and then requesting those specific things that you need in order to be able to participate with him in the advancement of his kingdom. All right, thank you guys very much.